This episode of our podcast is brought to you by Doolaban Insurance. If you live in Ontario, Canada, and are looking for the best price and coverage for your Tesla, give Doolaban a call at 1 855 385 4226 or visit their website at doolabaninsurance.com slash Tesla. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to the podcast. I'm your host, Trevor Page. Joining me tonight is Eric Camacho. How are you, Eric? I'm doing well, sir. How are you? Oh, I'm very well. Um, I think some of you may notice if you're watching the video or listening to the podcast, you may be noticing that uh, we're missing a member tonight. Ian is uh, taking a little staycation. Mm -hmm. So he's not available to do the podcast tonight, but he will join us on the next one. So we want to wish him a good time. Everybody needs a break now and then, especially Mr. Pravalco, because he works like a dog. I've seen him do it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Of course, if you've been paying attention, we didn't do a podcast last week because ah, there was just not a lot of Tesla news. And we felt that if we waited just an extra day or two, that we might get some more information. And of course, this week has just been chock full of Tesla stuff. Yep. So we, we got a lot to talk. This week. Yeah. We were very much rewarded, absolutely. So, um, well, without further ado, let's just jump right into it. Um, I want to start off, not to pat my own back here, but I got a scoop this week. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, this is something we've known for some time now, because about seven months ago, our, our friend Eric uh, from the Tesla Inventory YouTube channel, when he got his Performance Model 3, he put it on a lift because, as one does, he's going to do a lot of upgrades to his car. He noticed that there was a speaker grill on the passenger side in the front diffuser. That's the plastic cover in the front of the car. And, of course, the conjecture was going around that it's for the noisemaker. Well, lo and behold, um, I have some sources, uh, Tesla technicians, who reached out to me and said that they got a technical note that say that said, um, as of September 1st, all Model 3s, only Model 3s at this point, all Model 3s since September 1st, cars that are built, have the pedestrian warning uh, signal, uh, a sound, uh, built into the cars. Now, um, I also went onto my SoundCloud account and I posted two links uh, to Mm -hmm. the sounds that they sent me. So there's a sound in forward and another one in reverse. The forward one kicks in uh, when you go uh, 18.6 miles per hour or less. It's mostly white noise. And the reverse sound sounds like kind of a Jetson sound. It's kind of a UFO thing. So it's it's quite um, it's quite interesting. Um, I know that on the internet, Twitter, the forum. I mean, it's been blowing up. Uh, you got several camps of people, right? They're saying, "Oh, I'm okay with it." Other ones like, "I hate it. I'm going to disconnect it." And you got people like, "Give me sounds I can choose." <laughs> mm-hmm. So that's kind of the gamut that it's been running. Um, I will say this, and I've looked at the um, I've looked at the uh, the NHTSA regulations for this. Um, the, the, there's no provision at this point uh, for user-selectable user sounds. These are s- sounds that are kind of set in stone. Um, and the goal of these, and I'll put a link down in the video description if you guys really want to read this crazy stuff because it's really technical. But anyways, um, they've done a lot of research on this, and they've determined that these particular frequencies are good, and here's the sound levels it has to be, and it has to rise in pitch and descend in pitch so that blind people, and that's ostensibly what this is for, uh, can determine the relative distance and speed of the car. So that's what this is all about. It's not mm-hmm. about noise pollution. Uh, it, it, it goes away. So anyways, it's in regulations. It doesn't actually come into effect um, as far as all cars must have this. And that happens on September uh, September 1st, 2020. So Tesla's just kind of being proactive at this point, um, adding it into their cars. I would suspect it will happen to S and X later on. It's just not a priority right now. And I'll be honest, I think part of this is the reason, this is just speculation here, I think the reason they're doing it now for Model 3 is because you can get a lease on a Model 3 and the leases cannot be returned because Tesla wants the fleet back for their full autonomy thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a feeling that's why they're doing it now, so that they have those cars kind of ready for that fleet thing when the time comes. That's my... (laughs) That's my tinfoil hat going on. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 we've talked about it in the show before. I think there were some whispers about this in the past. We've sort of hinted about the policy uh, that NHTSA set forward uh, that you mentioned goes into effect in next September. Um, it's also good, too, because I think if, if these vehicles are changing owners, if you're changing hands, uh, you know, if, if, you know, that's something that's bound to happen at some point, uh, it's good to have it in place already. Uh, especially when there are some markets where there are obviously a lot more pedestrians than others, and that's going to come in handy uh, as as we come to to bear fruit in the market. So it's um it's good they're taking the proactive step to do that, um, and it's good you know that we're seeing now cars being produced 
uh, essentially a, a year ahead of the uh, the deadline to do that. And if, if someone wants to retroactively fix their car, I'm sure Tesla will have a bulletin to let servers know how they can do that. And uh, it's it's all for the better, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say this. I'm, I'm not really opposed to this. Um, I've heard lots of cars. I mean, there's lots of cars on the market now, mm -hmm. hybrids and otherwise that already have the sound maker thing. I've heard it before. Mm -hmm. Not particularly annoying. It's it's a little strange because if you're used to a car that doesn't make any noise, right. and all of a sudden you hear an EV or even a Tesla now that actually starts making this noise, it's a little strange. I remember um, the, the strangest one I ever heard was a, uh, was a Fisker Rivero. Okay. The new one, mm -hmm. which is... Whatever. Anyways, I heard uh, it was a prototype, pre-production prototype. Anyways, mm -hmm. make a long story short, it made this really weird humming sound that sounded like a heavy metal guitar sustain sound. That's about the best way I can explain it. Like I wish I wah, 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 wah. No, 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 no. It didn't waver. It just sounded like you know when you go, yeah, and that and it just. Sorry for Ooh. the folks listening. If that was in your ears, I apologize. <laughs> That's about my best approximation. It, it wasn't harsh. It was just this really low drone mm -hmm. kind of sound. Not unpleasant. Um, not very loud. So I'm not particularly opposed to it. It's just it is what it is. And hey, I do I do wonder it. though, could Tesla design the system in such a way where with the autopilot sensors, cameras, everything else, if it detects pedestrians, if it then makes sure that the system is engaged. Uh, like if you're in a parking lot, you know, obviously there's the chance of you backing out. There could be somebody who just can't see your car. So it's good to have it in those circumstances uh, where kids may be playing, stuff like that. But I wonder if if the cameras, if they detect pedestrians, if it automatically triggers it. Uh, so that way, in some cases, it doesn't go off. Um, but it, when it detects a person, at that time it would, just to kind of give some extra security and safety measure for both the driver and those pedestrians. I think you make some good points there. However, you know, the uh, devil's advocate in me just will say, I think it's just best to leave it and have it turned on no matter what. Because yeah. A, the regulations may require it no matter what. Sure. And B, autopilot's not infallible. What if a car uh, miss tags a person or a pet or something like that and misses the person completely? Mm. Uh, legally, I don't think they can really go there. Um, speaking of legally... <laughs> I know there's a lot of people that uh, are going to want to try and disconnect this and not do that or, or, or not use the system. I'm, I'm sure, I mean, there's going to be ways to disconnect this. I'm sure it's probably just a, a connection thing mm -hmm. you can just pull out. Um, and <laughs> if your car came with it and the regulation is in place, and let's say you have a mishap and you hit somebody and they sue you, and they come back and find out that your car had this, but you disconnected it. Now what happens? Mm -hmm. Like the safety feature was in the car and you deactivated it. Now are you at fault? Yeah. Right? Right. My, my, my legal wife over there <laughs> is saying yes. She says it'll be bad. So be yeah. Bad. Yes. So anyways, we'll leave it at that. Um, I know there's lots of people that will have different discussions about that. We'll, we'll talk about more about this in the future once we get our hands on a car that actually has this noise. We'll talk about it. But uh, anyways, just want to let everybody know that, uh, again, once again, um, as of September 1st, all cars that were produced um, now have this noise maker built into the car. So Model 3s. Okay, moving along. Uh, we got some more news courtesy of Tesla Roddy. This article... Really technical here. Um, Tesla mm -hmm. patent points to a battery cell improvements with clever deformation detection process. Now, I actually kind of read this article and went through it. Again, uh, links to all of the articles and everything we talk about tonight will be in the podcast and the mm -hmm. uh, video description. Um, I want to make this clear here. My take from this particular article is that it's part of their test equipment during the manufacturing process. It's not built into the battery pack of the car. Um, basically, they say that, uh, and I'm going to, read a little bit from the, not the legal, but the patent stuff, and it's kind of weird here. But anyways, it says, a deformation detection apparatus includes a cell movement control assembly to handle a linear motion and rotational motion of a battery cell, a body that supports the cell movement control assembly, a digital micrometer, and control circuitry. The control circuitry measures a, plurari a plurality of uh, outer diameter values of the battery cell for a plurality of li linear positions and a plurality of 
rota uh, rotational positions along the longitudinal axis of the cell and determines a change in ge uh, geometrical shape or deformation or strain of the battery cell for the plurality of linear positions and all the plural. Oh, God, I can't pronounce. Why is that word so hard for you? I plurality. don't know. Anyways, the Micah. Long story short, this is a measurement device that uh, for the manufacturing processes of the cell to make sure that they don't swell. One of the things that happens with battery cells, and it's actually outlined in this in this patent and then they describe it is that when the cell gets into uh, temperature ranges that are outside of normal elevated essentially um, the cell wants to swell and um, any swelling of the battery is bad when it's in the car mm -hmm. because that starts playing with thermal management tubes and the selectic goo that's in the cell and all this other stuff so it's not good so if they can prevent this now I don't know how Tesla is actually measuring um, the cell manufacturing processes. I don't know how they're doing their tolerances inside, uh, but this basically points to some kind of device that they developed, large, probably from Groman Engineering, who knows, um, that actually measures all of these things as the cell comes out. Um, they do mention uh, 3D scanning, so there's a lot of tech in here. If you want to read it again, I'll put a, I'll put an article or I'll put a link down to the article, and you can you can take a look at it. But um, anyways, it's at the manufacturing side. It has nothing to do with the battery pack, and that's honestly that's where it belongs. You want to make sure that the cells are perfect before they go into the car before you have any problems later on. I mean, I mean, reading the story about this, what was interesting is that they get into how, what the current process is like for evaluating the batteries. And they're using either uh, what was defined as strain gauges or optical gauges. Um, but there's a deficiency in the optical gauges because they may not get the uh, deformation across the entire surface of the battery. So any, any area that's missed, as you just pointed out before, if that gets then put into the car, that could, of course, lead to maybe potential issues down the road. Down the road. That's funny. Mm -hmm. So um, so with this new uh, patent that he filed, um, one of the things that Tesserati, this article, points out is that it could even improve the durability of the batteries, which then could increase range of performance. And we're already seeing incredible performance from the batteries now. So even if you're able to somehow improve it by a, a few percentage points, that can add enough mileage that all of a sudden now you're going maybe from 400 miles to 410, 420, 430. Um, so it is it is a pretty interesting uh, patent that they they figured out. But if there's one thing I'm consistently impressed by is the number of patents that Tesla puts out there for advances in battery technology specifically that you just your jaw hits the floor going, how do they come up with this stuff? Um, when ideally this is all new technology, this is all brand new. Uh, in the industry, so it's uh, it's all the more impressive. Yeah, they're doing their own battery te technical stuff. I mean, you're not yeah. going to see. I mean, the other manufacturers, if you see LG or Samsung, those are the other two that are pretty big in the industry. Um, if they do any kind of patents on, on this level, I haven't actually seen any either. That they're, they're not filing them, they're not disclosing it. But anyways, it just kind of fits in hand in hand with Tesla said before that they want to go vertical. They want to be the master of their own domain, so to speak. If if I was to paraphrase uh, uh, Seinfeld at that point, they want to control over their future. So if yeah. that means manufacturing the cell, they also have to have processes in place to actually make sure for their quality control. So anyways, kudos for Tesla for doing this. Um, there's been some other st uh, talk. We'll, we'll talk about something else here in a moment here about some more cell chemistry. Um, Eric, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, inside EVs and uh, sales of SX and 3 in August? Because sure. it looks like we have some prediction numbers here. We do. So uh, Inside EVs was able to get some figures uh, that are estimate figures uh, for August. Now, we know that normally we get figures released from Tesla for end of quarter figures. Uh, so that would be something that we're expected to have now coming up uh, as we end this final month in September and head into October, which begins quarter four. Um, so we're not yet at quarter three's final numbers, but we do have some estimates of how uh, Tesla did in the month of August. Uh, specifically when it came to deliveries in the U.S. So um, according to Inside EVs, their estimates show that Tesla delivered some 13,150 Model 3s to U.S. buyers in August. Uh, that's a little bit lower than what was delivered in July, which was 13,450. It's also substantially down, as the article states, uh, from June, where there were over 21,000 Model 3s delivered. But again, that was also a major push because that was uh, the end of Q2. It was also below the 13,950 Model 3s delivered to U.S. buyers in May of this year, but well above the 10,050 uh, delivered in April. So overall, we're seeing uh, you know a year-over-year -year figure uh, from August 2018 to August 2019 down by about 13,150. 
uh, Model 3 to delivered. So while that is expected uh, to see a little bit of a drop just because of the push we usually have at end of quarter, uh, it's, it's actually interesting to see about how S and X did. So the Model S uh, in August had about 1,050 uh, deliveries in the U.S. and Model X had 1,825. Now the combined figures for S and X were far below the August 2018 numbers, uh, which are about 2625 for Model S and 2750 for Model X. But they were both figures of improvement over July numbers, where the estimates were 975 deliveries for Model S and about 1,225 models or deliveries for Model X. So the the good thing is that we're seeing Model 3 sales are down a little bit, but Model S is holding steady, and Model X deliveries are up. Now, again, we'll wait for final figures in uh, after end of quarter this coming uh, month when we have, we're about, this is recording on September 12th, so we're about mm, two and a half weeks away uh, from end of quarter. So we may see those numbers all increase uh, across the board as we hand into these final weeks before uh, Q3 uh, ends and Q4 begins in October. Yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, we don't want to read too much into these numbers because right. um, traditionally the way Tesla builds their cars is that at the start of a quarter, quarter's three months, so in this mm -hmm. case it's from July to the end of September, they build their cars for right now until the Chinese Gigafactory comes online. They build everything for Europe and China at the beginning of a quarter because those cars have to travel the furthest distance. Right. Right. So they will start production for those cars at the beginning of the month. They shove them onto the ships and so on and so forth. And towards about two-thirds of the way through the quarter, generally, I'm speaking generally here, um, they will then switch to North American production because it only takes them a week to send a car from the West Coast to the East Coast because they're throwing them on uh, truck carriers now. Um, so uh, somewhere around um, beginning of September, late August or something like that, then they switch to North American production. They send all those cars to the East Coast, and then they kind of work their way back. We've been tracking this for some time. So, again, um, don't want to read too much into this in August. I think it's interesting that the Model X is doing so well comparing to the Model S. I'm seeing a lot more Model Xs. Uh, these days, and I think it's probably because of a bit of a shortfall because of all the rumors that were swinging around about a Model S refresh, right? Of course, that's going to affect their sales and stuff. So anyways, looking forward to seeing what they actually pull off. Um, the other thing, too, should mention, of course, that Tesla has revised their <laughs> benefit program for the referral codes now. So I was just thinking the, that. Exactly. So uh, you must take delivery. So if you order a Model 3, or actually any one of the cars. Right, any one of them. Yeah, any one of the cars as of what was the day and then they changed it. It was a few days. It was a few days ago. Like Monday. Um, I'm gonna call it Monday. It was earlier this week, yeah. Okay. So earlier this week they changed the program. So if you order a car as of that day, you must take delivery by October first. You get two thousand miles of free supercharging. Uh, it's not retroactive. So I know a lot of people reached out to me and says like, Oh, I you know, I placed my order, can I call Tesla? No, 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 you can't do that anymore. Tesla's very, very strict about referral codes. You must order with a referral code. Uh, with a referral code, um, and it's not retroactive. So if you missed it by a day, uh, sorry, your SOL, you can't do anything about that. But anyways, the bottom line, why do they do that? End of quarter push. That's end of quarter push, about. yes, always. Uh, we, we're always. intimately familiar with end of quarter pushes <laughs> as far as, t as Tesla's concerned. So anyways, um, hoping that uh, Q3 for this year is going to be really good. Hopefully, if all goes well, we should see the numbers uh, probably within the first week or so when Tesla announces those. And then... Um, if the financials are looking good, we may see financials being announced uh, sooner than typically, which is actually, usually they release those numbers about a month later. So end of quarter is end of September. Um, so that puts us somewhere around early, really late October, early November. Yeah. Typically, they will talk about third quarter numbers. But um, if we see a date any sooner than that, let's say about two weeks into mm -hmm. October, uh, that's probably an indicator that things are going to be good as far as profitability is concerned. Anyways, just based on history, uh, it's not like I have inside information. So Yeah, the basic thing is if there's an equinox in a month, there's an end of quarter push. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All yeah. right, um, moving on. Um, you know, Tesla's been filing a lot of patents lately, so we're going to dump you don't jump say. back. Yeah, you don't say. We're going to jump back in here and talk about some more patents. Well, one of them was just released. Tesla's issued a patent for an electromagnetic windshield wiper system. <laughs> so cool. Say that five times fast. Anyways, I'm going to bring up the uh, plurality. Uh, yeah, plurality. Yes, that's the name of the show. Thank you very much. Um, all right. 
So if you look at this thing, and I'll put a link in the uh, uh, video in the podcast description, you can check it out for yourself. Um, you know what? I, I look at this thing and it screams Roadster to me. Um, everything in these diagrams shows a single wiper blade system. Of course, the Roadster is the only one that Tesla makes right now that has a single wiper, at least shown in the prototype form. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about this, and if you look through the diagrams and you read about it, is that there is basically, um, uh, it's an electromagnetic magnetic rail system that actually moves the uh, fixed point of the uh, windshield wiper along a rail system along the bottom. Uh, so it minimizes a lot of the extra parts that they have to build and hopefully some reliability, although windshield wipers are pretty pretty reliable these days. As a side effect, um, the way they've designed it is the windshield wiper can actually um, go underneath um, the uh, front hood in a secure area. So that helps aerodynamics. That's one right. thing I've noticed on the Model X compared to all the other cars is that the windshield wipers go really deep down inside. Now... There's a bad part to that, though, of course, is that I live in the winter months up here, and when winter and, and snow builds up in that area, you have to be really careful because you got to clear out that area. Otherwise, you're going to break your windshield wipers. So good and bad on both parts. I think it just shows that Tesla is certainly innovating on here. But again, everybody was like, oh, this is for the Roadster. This is for the Roadster. So <laughs> I don't think it's exclusive to the Roadster. I think in due time, this kind of technology will eventually make it in other cars. Again, just because Tesla puts out a patent doesn't necessarily mean they will use it. It just means that they're working on stuff. So anyways, it, I, don't read too I, much into it. I would say I encourage you listeners uh, and those watching this on YouTube, if you get a chance, go down and actually look. Just even the abstract description in English about really what this cool. system is, is, you know, it, it might be for some listeners a little bit sort of uh, scientific and over their head. But even just reading it, like, it does sound like it's going to be a really cool system. But the images do help explain uh, what you're reading and sort of like, okay, now that sort of makes sense. Um, there's even a tab on the page for drawings. You can see all the different renderings that they've had for yeah. this patent. Um, but it, I mean, the only thing is I kind of like the, like if you think about basic wipers, they largely haven't changed in decades. They really, they really have. I mean, you know, some cars might have wipers go in opposite directions or, uh, you know, you might have trucks, you know, come from above instead of from down below. But largely, just they swipe in a you know a basic arc, uh, like a semicircle. But for this to see this is like ooh. Even if you could just see it, as, like even if it never makes it to like full production cars, just see it on a prototype, like ooh, it'd be kind of cool. I will caution people: if you go look at these diagrams, don't read anything into the diagrams. Everything about patents I've ever seen, uh, patents are always just concept conceptual mm -hmm. drawings and stuff like that. So if it looks like a car you've never seen before, don't assume that this is some kind of new Tesla they're developing. Uh, yeah, so just look at the diagrams. They're, they're quite interesting. Uh, try to make sense of it and stuff. But uh, anyways, I hope that comes out. I mean, you don't innovate window? like this. I don't know what the 107 is. It's fine. It's just a yeah, number. Yeah. Don't, don't worry about yeah. it. Okay, moving along. Um, not necessarily patent here, but... Um, the battery. Tesla <laughs> Tesla is always working on new battery technology, and in concert with the um, uh, the group that they've uh, hired um, uh, from Duluth University in uh, Halifax, there with Professor Jeff Don, um, it looks it looks to me that Tesla may actually have uh, <laughs> a holy grail here in terms of uh, cells. I'm going to um, I'm going to bring this up a little bit. I, I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but basically. It really paves the way. What they've actually developed here uh, really paves the way for a over 400 mile range Tesla and a one million mile uh, one million mile life. Um, this was alluded to, of course. Um, Elon said on Twitter that it won't be too long before they see a 400 mile battery uh, on a car, as well as talking about their uh, battery investor day that they're going to hold sometime early next year. I'm going to make a prediction. Now, uh, there's no prizes to be won here or anything, but I'm just going to make a prediction Aww. here <laughs> that during the Battery Investor Day, the person that's going to be on stage talking about this is going to be Jeff Don himself. I just have a feeling. So the bottom of the line here uh, the, uh, is that they developed a new um, uh, NMC. Now, Tesla's been using an NM, NMA or N, NM nickel metal aluminum. Uh, battery for some time and now they're switching to uh, more graphite in it um, and I think it's uh, yeah it's an NMC 532 and with some dual salt additives to the electrolyte because most of the research has been going into the electrolyte because and this is there's some confusion out here for battery stuff now I'm not a battery expert but it certainly interests me that 
the the term lithium ion is not the name of the cell because that's what's the primary constituent of the cell. The lithium, yes, there's lithium in the in the battery, but it's only about two percent. It's actually aluminum and nickel and and some graphite. That's really what the battery is. The name of lithium ion comes from the uh, chemical process of the of the ion exchange that happens between the anode and the cathode. It's it's a it's a poor name for the battery cell, but anyways, we're stuck with it, and that's what we have to do. Anyway, so the bottom line here is that battery degradation happens because there's actually a, it's a physical phenomenon because they have something that 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 builds up. They're called dendrites and so on and so forth. On one side, I think it's the anode and the cathode. I think it's on the cathode. Anyways, it's like a plaque buildup. And eventually what happens is that battery degradation happens because then the lithium ions can't pass through it as much, and that, and that plaque buildup is irreversible. That's what leads to battery degradation. So anyways, the bottom line here is that they've developed some additives through electrolyte that almost gets rid of that buildup completely. Um, they've done considerable amount of testing with these cells, and I'm going to try and find the conclusion here at the end. Here it is right here. Conclusion, single crystal NMC 532 graphite cells with exceptional lifetime have been developed. Storage and cycle testing up to three years in duration has been presented at 20, 40, and 55 degrees Celsius. This is what matters here. This is the main part right here is that they have to control the temperatures, which is why Tesla has the best temperature management system. Anyways, the lifetime of these cells far exceeds that of other NMC graphite cells reported in the literature and which have been used for lifetime modeling. It is suggested that lifetime models for NFC graphite cells consider the, da uh, uh, consider the data presented here. Um, let's see here. Uh, where was it? And I've lost my spot. Anyways... It's crazy. I, I'm going to encourage you guys to go and read this. But they're saying here that um, 10 years of lifetime at 70% capacity and a total driven distance of 1,200 kilometers, uh, 1.2 million kilometers is projected. It's uh, worthy. It's worth noting that only 3,650 3, uh, cycles would be required for this total driven distance and 3,700 uh, cycles have been demonstrated. So bottom line, um, I think they found almost the holy grail here of cells. So I'm, I'm going to throw this part out there because I'm reading this as well as you are. Okay. At 20 degrees Celsius, cells can be stored at full charge for 1.3 years with about 0% loss and no impedance change. And at 90% charge with 0% loss and no impedance change. The capacity loss rate is 0.0, .0 per year. At 40 degrees Celsius... Uh, cells can be cycled at... Um, I mean, there's they kind of kind of go in this... But like the the... The numbers they have in all these different tests, like it's crazy. At four degrees Celsius, uh, at four degrees Celsius, cells can be stored at full charge for 1.3 years with about 3% loss and a 10% impedance change, or 90% charge with about 1.5% loss and 8% impedance change. So you mentioned earlier, like with wipers, like temperature matters a lot with batteries more than anything. And even seeing at 40 degrees Celsius, which for those of you guys in America, that's very hot. Um, the 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 loss is still tiny compared to what it is now, so that's that's incredible. Yeah, forty degrees is outside the thermal envelope you want to be operating. <laughs> Basically, they're saying at twenty percent at twenty C, if we can keep the battery at twenty degrees Celsius, it's like you got a twenty year battery right there. Boom, right. it's done. No, no loss in one point three years. This is crazy. Zero percent, like z z not like you know tiny number. Like no, it's zero percent. As in, it's not. There's no loss whatsoever. No loss. Yeah, for a year. For all intents and purposes, your battery degradation is is basically a thing that's of the basically past. sixteen months. That's crazy. Yeah, when so, and years ago, it used to be like you'd get like four or five percent year over year when when Model S first got released. So yeah. there's no coincidence. The fact that Elon mentioned four hundred mile battery, we're already at three seventy. Not that much more to get yeah. to four hundred. Four hundred battery investor day coming up. Tesla wants to build their own battery cells. Professor Jeff Don releasing this documentation. It's out there in the wild. They're making it uh, available for anybody to look at. Uh, everything. I mean, it's all pointing. Battery Investor Day is the one to watch because that's when they're going to talk about this. Okay, you ready this for is where things are going. Even if the cells, and this is from the story, uh, from the article, even if the cells were continually at 40 degrees Celsius, 10 years of lifetime to 70% capacity and a total driven distance of 1.2 million kilometers is projected. It's worth noting that only 3,650 cycles would be required for this total di uh, dis driving distance to be accomplished. Mm -hmm.
but 3,700 cycles have been demonstrated. So that talk about endurance. That's that's like you said, not optimal temperature. No. Even then, you're still reaching 1.2 million kilometers at 40 C. Yeah. Over 10 years. That's crazy. Yeah. It's awesome. All right. We're not going to belabor the point. Uh, we will keep an eye on this one. And when the Battery Investor Day uh, comes up, you can bet that we will be talking about that. I'm going to be watching that because that kind of stuff really spins my little beanie cat propeller. All right. All right. Moving along. Uh, courtesy of Bloomberg. Uh, is GA5 coming? GA5 stands for General Assembly 5. Uh, Tesla has taken out some building permits in Fremont. Uh, talking about a GA5 demo and rough grading. GA5 refers to General Assembly. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, the tent, as people call it. It's not a tent. It's a sprung structure. Get it right. <laughs> Anyways, so a lot of this really points to possibly starting to gear up to build the production lines for Model Y, possibly, mm. or increasing existing production of, you know, Model 3, because that's where they build the Model 3. It's, it's actually mm -hmm. GA4. So we'll keep an eye on this. We don't uh, have any more details about this other than a, a building permit that was taken out. But it uh, points that Tesla is certainly moving. I don't know where the heck can they put this tent. I mean, if you look at Google Maps, you can see GA4s on the Google Maps. Yeah. But there's not much left out there. I mean, at one point, that whole factory, by the way, that factory, just for people who don't remember, um, used to be operated uh, jointly between GM and Toyota. It was called the Numi factory at the time. And at the time, they had a lot of rail yards in there, and they would put all the cars on rails. They ripped up all those rails. They've been gone now for a few years. So Tesla's been you know, th throwing everything on trucks. So if you look at the Google map, you're like, okay, where are the trains? Ah, there's no trains anymore. So mm -hmm. literally, if you're down there, um, and you're down in the Fremont, the factory, I mean, the, the road is lined up all the way down the street with truck carriers because as soon as the cars come off the line, they put them on the truck carriers. And that, it doesn't mean they don't put them on rail. They just don't do them there in the yards anymore. So the bottom line is, I don't know where they're going to put this tent. Obviously, they're going to have to put it somewhere because there's not a lot of room in there. I do spend a little bit of time now and again on Google Earth just keeping an eye on what's going on in Fremont. <laughs> it's always interesting to see. So anyways, maybe, maybe Model Y a little sooner. I don't know. I don't think so. I think Tesla's trying to hold on to uh, timelines at this point. But hey, if it changes, um, you know, people will be pretty happy about that. Love, you know, love to be able to see the Model Y sooner rather than later. Okay, uh, moving along. Okay, we're going to talk about some Twitter stuff now because, of course, Elon, for whatever reason, took to Twitter, and uh, he's been pretty quiet on Twitter lately. But um, anyway, he started giving us some information. So someone um, asked, uh, hi, Elon. Oh, this is our friend Vincent, by the way. Um, hi, Elon. Any chance to have a pickup truck unveiling event before the end of October? Need to schedule my trip. Don't want to miss it. Elon says November is most likely. So looks like we have a possible... Elon time for the uh, <laughs> for the pickup truck unveiling. So looking forward to that. I'm going to try and keep my schedule open as much as possible. Um, I don't know. Might even do a road trip or something. I don't know. We'll see what, what transpires. So anyways, at this point, that's what we know. Possibly November. Um, again, Elon time could slip. So don't hang your hat on it too much, but at least we have some kind of rough idea. He did say a few months ago that it would be sometime later this year, so... Yeah, in July, he that uh, that tweet storm from the weekend uh, that I sort of summed up, and I believe I'm trying to find the tweet when he mentioned it. Uh, um, they were so this is back in July. So the team is addressing the final details. The debut may be in two to three months. Okay. So two to three months would put you in that October ish time frame. So if he's saying more like November now, then that would have been based on this timeline. Yeah, you're looking at probably close three to four months. But I mean, again, that's that's an estimate. Of he the did time. say some time ago. He kind of reiterated that he, you know, the devil was in the details. They want to make sure that right. this thing is right. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't surprise me that they want to do this pickup reveal as soon as possible because there's been a lot of noise about pickups. That's the next electric vehicle to really disrupt the market at this point. Right. Uh, I mean, you got your sedans, you got your small SUVs, got your big SUVs, pickup trucks. I mean, semi trucks I mean, look, don't really matter as much. But as far and as passenger very, vehicles are concerned, I mean, what, what yeah. other kind of cars are there, right? It could very well be they're looking at Earl's uh, Photoshop designs and trying <laughs> to get them in the cars or in the truck as soon as they can. So we, you right. never know. Earl's an awesome Photoshopist. <laughs> I say that, that jokingly. That, that, I was going to say, is that a thing, a Photoshopist? Uh, yeah, I guess. But uh, yeah. Earl's, Earl's particular penchant for doing um, very quick and dirty Photoshop jobs oh are, are, are actually hilarious. So Calling it dirty is being too kind. <laughs> It's all part of the fun, right? No, of course. It's hilarious. It's really All good. right. 
Uh, moving along, uh, Tesla and Elon, both at the same time, kind of tweeting out some news. So uh, Elon did say last week that they were going to take the Model S to the Nuremberg track and uh, try and do some test runs. Now, he didn't say that they were specifically looking for a particular lap time or whatever. They were just going to take a car over there. So not only did they do that, and unfortunately I don't have the video, but I do have pictures courtesy of... Uh, of inside EVs, but they also ran the car, or a car, we'll talk about this in a second, here at the Laguna Seca track. So uh, Tesla's tweet went out and says, we lapped Laguna Seca in 1 minute 36 seconds and 0.555 during advanced R&D testing of our Model S plaid powertrain and chassis prototype. That's a second faster than, this, than the record for a four-door sedan. All right. We have to talk about this for a second because there's something called plaid powertrain. What the heck is this? We've well, gone plaid. We've gone full plaid. Now, for those of you who don't know, Tesla used to have um, ludicrous, or no, what was it? Uh, gosh. Insane, insane mode. And then they had ludicrous. And then they have something called plaid. But plaid was never really defined until we saw the Roadster. Mm -hmm. So plaid is the acceleration maximum plaid. Um, is the acceleration for the Roadster. So it's largely a powertrain. Now, if you look at what the if you look at the specs of the Roadster, so it's a 200 kilowatt hour battery pack. Um, it has three motors, so two in the back, one, uh, yeah, two in the back, one in the front, and most likely more advanced power electronics. Something what they did with the Performance Model Three with better silicon carbide um, inverters and stuff. Oh, of course, and the Raven updates that they did. So when they say that this is their Plaid prototype. Um, this is talking about the drivetrain or a derivative of the Roadster drivetrain that's going to go into the Model S and the Model X. Uh, Elon did take to Twitter to clarify this situation. He said, to be clear, the Plaid powertrain is about a year away from production and applies to SX and Roadster, but not the Model 3 or the Model Y. It will cost more than our current offerings, but less than competitors. Now, we had a little chat here before the show. I don't think this is any coincidence because last week it was all about the Porsche Taycan. And, you know, everybody was going crazy about oh, what it can do on the track and so on and so forth. That, that car is a proper track car. I mean, it's a Porsche after all. So I don't think there's, it's not a coincidence that a lot of the stuff that's happening right now, I don't know, I don't think it's deliberate on Tesla's part to try and shift the discussion over. I think it's just an opportunity for them to say, hey guys, uh, we're not sitting still here. We've got some other stuff up our sleeve. I do think it's interesting though that Elon would actually start talking about this, this this far away down in production. If we're talking about a year from now, you know, it's it's unusual for him to actually do this. I mean, yeah, there's leaks. I mean, Kim from the Like Tesla channel had talked about this a few months back. Back, I think it was back in July. They did a video talking about this, and everybody's like, "Ah, you're, I don't know." And Elon said, "No, no, no, no." Well, looks like they're vindicated now. This is actually a real thing. Um, and it would not surprise me. Uh, and we do know about the Nuremberg track that it, Elon did take the Twitter and say, oh, by the way, it was a seven-seater. We haven't seen a seven-seater in a while. I don't. I won't read too much into that. But um, I don't know. Do we think that's a plaid powertrain? I mean, or they were just having fun over there? By the way, I should bring up these pictures now, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Keep talking, Eric. I'm going to bring up these pictures. So, well, you know, see. so, so we, 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 we did talk about before the show. I, I, you know, I think a lot of this was sort of in the planning stages before uh, mm -hmm. the time camp. And I, I want to give props to Porsche, um, you know, that they do deserve a lot of accolade for what they put out there. Um, you know, it certainly is not the EV for everyone, uh, whether your aesthetics or performance or price or whatever it might be. Um, I did see some photographs of some people sitting in the back seat, and I'm like, ooh, it looks kind of tight. But you know what? It's it's hard to find the perfect vehicle. Uh, but you know what, though? The, again, we've talked about it before. The more EVs in the market, the better it's going to be. Uh, so, I mean, Porsche did what they wanted to do, and they put out a Porsche like DNA electric vehicle uh, that really brought a lot of attention to it. Um, and they and they had a lot of good press. Uh, they had a lot of good coverage on it. They were friends of ours, um, uh, NSA and many others who who put out blogs and stories and write ups on uh, on the vehicle. So, listen, good for them. Uh, I think that for Tesla's part now, the timing does kind of make you scratch your head, going, "Hmm, <laughs> are you really trying to one up?" Porsche, I, I think part of this is this has been sort of in the pipeline for a while, especially when you have Elon telling you like, hey, we've already built like you don't just go building a powertrain in your workshop over a weekend. Like this no, is no, probably no, no, no. 
this has been going on for some time. Um, but I do find it interesting that maybe they had some of this already done and they were waiting for Porsche to do their results and go, okay, now we're going to do ours and see how it compares. I don't know. Um, but I do think it's interesting that at least we're sort of putting this out there and seeing how the, the vehicle performs uh, with this new powertrain. Um, and whatever those early results are going to be now, even if it is a year or so away uh, from being in production, if you're getting early results that just floor you, then and you're going to somehow still find ways of improving the system in the next 12 to 16 months. I mean, that's just mind blowing. That's, that's what's going to happen if that's what their uh, their plans are. They definitely do have to test these powertrains well in advance. I mean, I was sent pictures and video of a performance Model 3 running around at the track way before this car ever went into production. Yeah. Um, and that was at least a year. So yeah. anyways, I got some of these pictures here. I'm going to bring them up here. These are courtesy of uh, Inside EV. So a few observations about this particular car. So you'll notice in the front and the back, it has uh, wider fender flares uh, to accommodate some super wide tires that they put on this thing. I have a feeling that because this powertrain is so powerful that they had to put a little bit more contact patch. Ian's not here to confirm this. He's our tire guy, but I'm just throwing that out there. Um, the only other thing that I've noticed on this car is that the intake, the lower intake uh, on the front of the car for the intercooler is much bigger. Um, yeah, so pretty big. Let me see if I can pull up one of these other pictures. There, there's a few pictures of this car. It has aftermarket rims. God, they look like FCO 4s Yeah. They look just like FCO4s. Ian would be happy to see this. <laughs> um, badging on the rear of the car. <laughs> Where's the picture? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? They had a close-up. Anyways, P100D Ludicrous Plus. Mm. <laughs> so anyways, yes, this is a... Uh, uh, this is this is a car that has a different powertrain in it, obviously. It's what they call the plaid powertrain. I don't know. I'm going to speculate here. I don't know if it's actually pulled out of the Roadster per se, or it's a derivative. We don't know. Uh, but the fact that they put wider tires on this thing, bigger intercooler, tells me that this thing has a lot more power on there. Again, no evidence of a larger battery pack. Can't tell. Don't know. Um, anyways, time will tell. Um, the fact that it's going to cost more means that, uh, well, you got a second motor in the back. That's what the Plaid's all about. It looks like it has carbon ceramic brakes on it, but I can't tell. I mean, these are pictures that are taken with the potato. Can you imagine what the 16, 0, 100 times are going to be? Uh, oh, yeah, it's going to be crazy. I would say uh, I would say this car, I don't know. Look, uh, P100D Ludicrous does 2.3 on the 0 to 60. You think it brings uh, two seconds? Yeah, I would say so. Crazy. Kind of halfway between the Roadster does, which is 1.8. I think that's reasonable. Anyways, so, uh, yeah, Model S is not sitting still. So, anyways, um, I don't I mean, know if... The I think I would say this. There are a lot of folks who sort of suggested that the Model S is really needing some attention. There's, there haven't been a lot of significant changes. Um, we know that the online, you know, the way the online configurator has had different menu items made unavailable. Uh, you can't get a sunroof anymore. There are certain change, but like that's just config stuff. We really haven't seen the Model S have any major, major changes since really, I think really since the front fascia of the vehicle was changed after Model X. The front fascia, by the way, was a significant change. I've looked at the body repair manuals because you can actually see a lot more of the structure of the car. That was a significant change. Um, the interior, other than finishes, hasn't seen any. Like there, there hasn't been a whole lot. So no. Uh, it, it would be interesting if they're able to, if, if the powertrain is really the next big thing they're focusing on, um, if the rumored interior changes, are, whether they're subtle or if they're significant to have some Model 3 slash Y uh, integrations to that, we That's don't a know. Given, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I think it's a matter of, of when, not a matter of if at this point, but I mean, it's now September. We're looking at now Q4 coming up. I don't think it's going to happen this year, no. uh, the way things are trending, but um but yeah, it, it, it is, the Model S is one of those cars I think now needs, needs some, some good updates. Yeah, I would, I would say if they're going to do an interior refresh, tie it all in at the same time of the car. Yeah. Um, do it next year when you do this whole revamp and, and call it a day. Um, you know, the Raven update, as nice as it, as it is, it's, it's not a, what, what a lot of people would actually call a refresh. Tesla doesn't, does, doesn't do traditional refreshes. Announcing the new, <laughs> all new, they don't do that. Um, but anyways, uh, I just hope, <laughs> my main thing, I mean, there's some creature comforts. If you watch the evolution of the Model S and then the Model X and the Model 3, um, other than the Model S, the other two cars I've seen a lot more in terms of creature comfort accoutrement inside the car. you got code hooks, you got 
pockets behind the seats, pockets inside the door, uh, adjustable seat belt height. Model S still doesn't have that. Seven years later, and we still only have half that. So yeah, there's some areas in there that that the Model S definitely needs some improvement on. By the way, great choice of word, accoutrement. Accoutrement. Fine Lab has a line of protective coatings that were engineered to protect your Tesla's paint, leather, carpet, plastic, and wheels, effectively blocking all those UV rays and environmental factors before they ever get to ruin your brand new baby. Fine Lab offers a complete line of car care products and ceramic coatings for both the do-it-yourselfer and professional detailers. Did we mention we also have the world's first self-healing coating? Check us out at finelab.com, that's spelled F-E-Y-N-L-A-B, to see the science behind the self-healing. Check out our product catalog and click contact us for a free quote from a certified installer in your area. Fine Lab and Tesla. We were meant for each other. So that's the news that we have to cover this week. Um, I did put out a tweet today asking for viewer and listener questions. So uh, let's jump into that. And I want to say thank you to everybody who submitted. Um, and if we can't get to all of your questions, it's usually because we don't know the answer or we have a party who's not present. Who can, who... <laughs> that's true. <laughs> our wheel and tire guy is not here today. He's our tire guy. I'm just <laughs> I'm the tired guy. That's really all it is. Uh, and without him, we can't necessarily take a stab at some of that stuff. Anyways, let's jump in here. Uh, first one comes from Eric. He says, do you think a uh, Tesla retrofit will ever be available for the Model 3 tow package? Uh, he says, I know there's aftermarket options, but they bring up possible warranty concerns or, or my warranty concerns unfounded. Well, I can speak from this. Um, so the Model 3 uh, in Europe... Um, you can order it with the tow package because I and I'm going to reiterate here, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I believe European law says if you have to, if you're going to get a tow hitch on the car, you can't install it necessarily third party. It has to be OEM. So that's why they make the tow package available mm -hmm. for those cars. Now I do know that at least since April of this year, that Model Threes that have been delivered in North America um, have the hole on the bottom of the rear diffuser. Uh, for a tow hitch access hole, much like what the Model X has, although there's no tow package inside there. There's also wiring um, right by where, if you were to take the rear bumper off, you can see where the latch comes down, there is a, a, a connector just kind of hanging there with a cap on it. Um, so I believe that's for the tow package. So the only, um, not official, but tow package you can buy right now is called the Eco Hitch. Sure. Uh, very nice product. Um, you can install it. It'd take you probably a couple, three hours to install. Um, it's a very easy install. Tesla's actually put all the parts on there to actually accept the tow package. So it it's not a warranty thing because, uh, at least in North America, the only reason a manufacturer can deny you a warranty is if the modification you made to the car is the root source of what you're trying to claim for. Right. So in the case of a tow package, you know, the car is designed to have it. So yeah, the putting e a th the Eco Hitch, which is made by Torque Lift Central, right. uh, they make it for the Model S, the Model 3. Uh, of course, the Model X already comes with the tow package. Um, yep. And then the uh, because you're not drilling into the body of your car, uh, you're just essentially fixing it to mounts that are already on the vehicle. That's right. Uh, that's why you're not voiding your warranty or anything. So um, there's been there have been customers that have asked about this before. It's not something that's unusual. Um, a lot of folks are worried because other vehicles sometimes you have to you know modify the body of your car. With the Eco Hitch, you do not do that. So it's no. it's now it is recommended if you do buy the Eco Hitch to get professional installation done. You want it done right. You want to make sure you're not doing anything wrong. Um, you know, if you're not uh, handy with basic tools. Yeah, and Torque Lift has on their website dealer locators that can help you find installers. So it's yeah. very easy to do. You can buy it from them. You can buy it from a number of different uh, retailers online. Um, you can buy it from a sponsor of the show that sells uh, aftermarket products. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, there are there are ways to get this stuff, but uh, yeah, you, you you can rest assured there are no concerns for that if you want to go aftermarket. Yeah. Okay. So, hope the answer is the question. Uh, let's see here. Next question comes from Jim. He says, "I got my Model Three in May of 2018. I thought I knew everything about it, but I learned something new in your podcast. Oh, well, that's good to know. Um, holding the park button down uh, turns the red I uh, parking icon on, and I assume produces a stronger level of parking brake. I searched the manual several times." and I could have find no mention of it. Uh, it did say that applying the parking brake from the touchscreen turns that uh, icon red, but I couldn't find anything in the menus to do that. So, uh, however, there was a, a note uh, that it would display an alert if the road was too steep. Um, was it in the release note? Uh, has Tesla confirmed that there are indeed two levels of parking brake? I looked at the manual, and I happen to have it here in front of me. Boop. 
and did a little search, and uh, the only thing I could find on there is page 57. It says your Model 3 may display an alert if the road is too steep to, uh, to park safely on. Uh, but there's no mention on here of pressing the stock in a little longer to actually get the harder grab. I think it's an undocumented feature. I think this is really what it boils down to. It's just not documented. It sort of reminds me, I forgot what movie it was. Oh, in A Few Good Men, when uh, Noah Wiley's character is being interviewed uh, about, um, you know, something that happened with the code red and stuff down in, in, in Camp Guantanamo. And then at some point, Tom Cruise's character comes up and he goes, can you tell me in the manual where the missile is? It's like, <laughs> it's, it's like what, well, how do you know where to go to lunch? We just follow the line for chow. Um, <laughs> there are, there's going to always be things that are not in the manual. Uh how to play chess, for example, it would not always be like, there are certain things we just don't get wind of. Uh, it's a great question that he asked. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot, some owners are surprised. Um, I know when I've gone on test drives in my car and I show people that they're like, well, that's kind of cool. I'm like, yeah, I live in Florida. Our roads are pretty much flat. So I, I really don't use it. But if you live in San Francisco, you <laughs> use it all the time. Yes, exactly. So, you know, it, it does, it does depend on where you're at, whether you kind of would frequently use it or not. So the bottom line is that if you just press it once, it puts it into normal park. If you press and hold, I think it's two seconds or three seconds, you get the red icon and it just grips. It's the same thing as going into the menu screen and pressing parking brake. It's, it's exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. So use it on hills all the time. I think Ryan actually mentioned it on his podcast as well. He does that. Being in San Francisco and stuff, he just kind of has to. It's just kind of second nature. So it's yeah. an undocumented feature. You're absolutely right. It's not in the manual. Perfectly safe to do. All right, next question uh, comes from Steve. I think this is a follow-up from his question last time because he says, let me try this again. <laughs> my, question is not, my question is not when Tesla will start the hardware three upgrades, but how long will it take to complete an upgrade? Oh is it God. six months, one year, two years? Uh, would this be a big challenge for the service organization because they don't have that much spare capacity if they don't start upgrades in earnest until FSD cap capabilities are released? I fear there will not be an all-out upset and so on and so forth. All right, so first things first. I got wind today from service technician that I talked to that the hardware upgrade process has started. Um, they received several dozen of these computers mm -hmm. already. Um, one of our followers, Sofian, who's also on the forum, reported that he had his Model S done um recently so i don't think there's any kind of rhyme or reason as to how they're going about this i'm not suggesting you calling tesla because you pay for fsd and you want it right away I'm just saying you're on the list if you paid for it you will get it um but i have from inside information that this program has actually started at least in the in the initial stages how long it's going to take well sophian reported that um it took 15 to 20 minutes to do so it's not that big of a deal at this point. I don't have the service manuals. I don't have the tech info. I don't know what's involved in switching it out. Um, I know hardware 2.5. I know hardware 3 is partially liquid cooled. I, I don't know 100%. I know on my end there were some fans involved. So anyways, I don't know exactly what's all involved. I know getting at the computer at the Model S and the X is, is relatively easy. Somebody who's experienced can do it fairly quickly. So the bottom line is I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know if mobile service can do it. I'm sure hoping that Tesla wants to take advantage of the mobile service people as much as possible if they can, because it does relieve stress. So anyways, we don't exactly have the answers. All I can tell you is that it's at least in the initial starting phase right now. I think, I think what's also going to compound the problem for us to answer this is we don't know how many people actually have FSD that are That's waiting true. to get it. Um, so the number of owners waiting for FSD is going to matter a lot. Uh, how does it, you know you said it may take 15 20 minutes for Sophia's car but you know is each model going to be different are s and x going to take longer or less than model three so there's there it's a lot of criteria to kind of figure out uh it's a good question uh i'm sure yeah. as we're as more as we get more information we can probably get make a better estimated guess um my initial thinking is uh because of the reported numbers that tesla's basically sitting in an account with mm -hmm. the F fsd orders that they can't actually like the unrealized profit Right, they can't cash those checks yet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm guessing that's a pretty high number of people with FSD or uh, at least had ordered it that are waiting for it, especially when earlier this year it was it was sort of discounted for a period of time and there was probably an influx of folks getting it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I my thinking is it's going to take at least six months to knock it all out, um, but it's parts availability, you know, service center, workload. I mean, it's going to be a number of different things, but um, it would not be surprising if it takes well over a year to get through all of them. 
he does say in his question, he says, "I fear there will a lot of be ups- uh, I fear there will be a lot of upset customers who may have to wait a year or more for the hardware necessary to use those capabilities for those of who paid for it." Um, remember, even though Elon says they will be feature complete by the end of this year, take that with a grain of salt. It is Elon time after all. Right. Regul- regulators. regulators. That's it. You know, a lot of, a lot there's of folks your caveat are, right there. I gotta tell people when when Elon does tweet something, it the smart approach is take it lightly. Like it, it's not <laughs> verbatim. It. Well, it in part two, because Tesla is having to work with agencies galore. They're working with NHTSA. They're working with you know federal agencies. Um, they're working with. I mean, you could have a even vehicle in like, Europe. They don't. I mean, they don't I, have proper autopilot. There, there's different things. I mean, you know how what regulatory agencies run uh, Tesla Canada has different procedures in place than what happens here in the US. And so vehicles are tested differently. There's all sorts of stuff. Um, so I, I think when, and I'm just going to kind of button up here really quickly, but I think overall, when Elon says something, it's not gospel. It's not something that we have to hold them to it. And again, FSD has been and will always continue to be contingent on regulatory approval. If you go to Tesla's website and you look at autopilot, it mentions two things software approval, make sure that they're saying that this thing's ready to go and it has to be approved by regulatory officials. So even if they have the hardware in the car, if your look, if where you live, they say, listen, Still we're not allowing, then it doesn't matter what your, com- your computer is. You can't drive your car autonomously. So exactly. there you go. Valid question, but we don't have all the answers yet. All right, moving along. Uh, next question comes from John. He says, uh, yeah, actually two questions. It says, will the pedestrian warning device be retrofitted onto older cars? And two, is the device required in Canada? So I'll answer this. Number one, um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, most regulations are such that if the, if, if the car was manufactured at a certain date and it, and it didn't come with it, you know, it needs it. Uh, mm-hmm. if, if, you, if it didn't have it when the car was manufactured, and the regulation wasn't in time; it wasn't in place. There's no requirement for you to have it. Your grandfather, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and second of all, is the device required in Canada? Now, I actually went and looked on the Transport Canada site. Um, Transport Canada did request feedback on this issue uh, back in February of 2018. Um, but beyond that, I I don't know what's transpired as far as that's concerned. I do know that Transport Canada follows about 95 percent of the rules in NHTSA in the U.S., although they're not always on the same track so sometimes it could take a year or two so i don't see any regulatory things on the transport canada says right now that we actually need it so even though tesla's putting it in their cars right now there's nothing that says we actually need it in canada so if there are model 3s being delivered that have been manufactured since september 1st and showing up in canada we don't know whether they're actually putting them in the cars or not at this point so so as far as a retrofit is concerned i wouldn't worry about it Unless the law says you must have it, uh, chances are you're your grandfather and you don't have to worry about it. All right, next question comes from Curtis. He says, with all the glass on the Tesla, do you think that adding ceramic tint to the roof will add more heat rejection aside from doing the windows, or is the tint on the roof sufficient enough? Um, absolutely. If you add ceramic tint to the center portion, it will certainly cut down on the heat. Um I don't know how much you're going to pay to get a ceramic tint on there compared to adding, say, the uh, the what is it, the sunshade that Tesla sells? There are third-party ones you can buy as well that are less than half the cost with Tesla charges. Um, it does make a difference if you put it in there. So I don't know what your hair situation is like if you have a bald uh, Whether, But uh, no, it does make a difference. Definitely ceramic tint is uh, considered to be some of the best tint out there. So if you live in a hot climate where there's a lot of sun and stuff, um, you may want to do that. Um, again, if you if you don't have the car yet, I would say try it for a little bit and just see. Um, but... Uh, uh, keep in mind, of, of course, that all the Tesla cars, that especially that piece of glass above your head, does have uh, UV and infrared coatings on it. So one is to prevent the UV from burning your head, and the second one is for heat rejection. So it does mm-hmm. have on there. If you want to add more, yeah, that's up to you. But it does work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question comes from Lachlan. He says, hi, guys. I'm wondering if you have any inside information about it or when premium connectivity will be coming to the SR+. Plus. Thanks for the podcast. Hi from Australia. Hello, Australia. Hello. Uh, Model 3s del- <laughs> have started this week. Yes, they have. We've been watching this. Forum is full of people hi. from Australia. It's so exciting to see that. I mean, for those of you, I mean, look, they were the first people in the world to reserve. <laughs> down, and they were the last to get the damn car. I mean, that's so sad waiting holy cow yeah um the answer to this is i don't know you know what i 
I'm going to lean towards thinking that it might not ever come to the SR Plus. Um, so part of it is like, all right, so people like me are grandfathered in with premium connectivity uh, where we don't have to pay for it. Uh, now, if you buy a new Tesla and you do get your premium connectivity, you're, it's free for the first year. And then it's actually about $100 a year thereafter. Uh, so you're talking about less than $9 a month US to have it. Um, my thinking is the SR Plus is sort of a stripped down version. So it may never come. Again, Tesla could certainly change this down the road because as things become cheaper and more efficient, sometimes they just go, hey, we're just going to throw this in for free. Um, but I would, I, would lean, I would tend to lean right now today thinking that it would not be offered. Um, but again, that could just be a software change down the road. Do know one thing. Uh, there have been some reports on the forum that people that did take deliveries of their SR Pluses before the latest software update um, had rear heated seats. Of course, it's not included in the SR Plus, but they are there. And uh, they were active when they got their cars. And then lo and behold, after software update, just stopped working. And people are like, oh, well, what happened? Well, I'm saying, well, you got exactly what you paid for. You had, some, you had a bit of a freebie for a while. Um, so yeah, kind of turning back into what you just said about the premium connectivity thing. Um, I don't know. I mean, at this point, if, if somebody makes enough noise about it, maybe Tesla might offer it. I mean, it won't be free. Yeah. Anything's possible. Uh, these cars are, um, in the SR plus, uh, other than the battery pack is largely software limited on purpose, just to generate profits. Do part, you know, I, I think, I think these cars are, again, you're, they're sort of computer control, but I think there's still something to be said that if you have the option of paying for a, a certain feature that the other ones have, but you're saying, I want to go on the lower end of the car, it would make sense to go, okay, well, we're not going to then all of a sudden now have feature after features be added in because there's a demand for it. I mean, obviously that can happen with any vehicle, any manufacturer. Um, so, I mean, you can't have like, you know, whenever, whenever this new powertrain comes out, whenever plaid comes out, some model S and are going, well, wait a second. Why, 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 why give me, he gets it. And I can't get it. Like, yeah. you know, t Tesla has to sort of hold down the fo their, their foot a bit on this and say, yes. we're, we're going to, we have these trims this way for a reason. If you wanted to have, you know, these, you want to have heated seats in the rear, you wanted to have this on your, then, then pay for it. Then actually get the vehicle that has it. Otherwise, if you're stripping down your car, then that's what you pay for. It's like years ago when you had the option of having a car without an AMF from radio. Or air conditioning. Right. As I'm saying, like, you know, those things at the time were not standard. If you bought the car without it, well, then you wanted to save money. And that's, mm -hmm. that's what you got. Drove off the lot with it. Yeah. All right. Two more questions. The next one comes from Daniel. says, I've been experiencing some range loss on my long-range Model 3 that I purchased last year in June. Charging to 90% used to give me 460 to 464 kilometers, and now I fluctuate between 450 and 454. Most of this loss seems to have happened over the last two months. Do you believe this is software-related? I sometimes worry that since I keep sentry mode on all the time, and I'm, and I'm causing more stress to the battery it ever goes to sleep and requires more charging. I try not to let the car drop below 20%. Thanks for your help. Okay, so first of all, first rule about Tesla is that, uh, unfortunately, they rate the cars at a certain range rate, um, and everybody seems to hold their foot down on that as to say, that's what I'm always going to get on the car. There are lots of factors involved here that will dictate how much range you get at any given different time. If you're in the habit of charging your car and... You do it too soon, and I've done this before. Um, if you charge too soon and you come in in the morning, there are some range losses involved through vampire drain. Sentry mode is a particularly bad one. If you leave sentry mode all the time, it drops your range. I would say, Daniel, if this is a concern for you, try operating sentry mode off for a little while and just see if your range comes back. If it comes back because by the time when you're charging and when you have sentry mode and then when you turn it off if the range comes back within a few days you know what the culprit is at this point mm. sentry mode does use a lot of energy which is why they say it turns off automatically when you reach 20 percent because it just drains the battery so much yeah so um yeah yeah keep in mind the, the camera stuff has to flood through all of the all of those cameras on the car are actually plugged into the autopilot computer so that autopilot computer has to be kept live that thing eats mm -hmm. energy more so than anything else in the car, um, other than battery heating and stuff, but that's a different matter altogether. So right. that computer has to be kept live. It uses a lot of energy, so it, it stands to reason. So anyways, that's my answer to you. Just turn sentry mode off. If you see it come back, you know what your culprit is. If you, if it doesn't fix the problem and you suspect that you have something else, just call Tesla. They can do a, a battery diagnostic. It doesn't cost you anything. It's under warranty, and they can tell you what's really going on. But try not to hang 
your hat on that that range all the time. I operate my cars always in percentage mode. Treat it like a cell phone. Treat it like a gas car. It's full. It's half. It's empty. Deal with it at this point. I don't worry about the range. The range is the range. It will change. Uh, we're coming into the colder months. He's Canadian. He's well. I'm not saying he's Canadian. Well, whatever kilometers. If you're going into the colder months, um, three three things are going to happen. <laughs> you being American, but still like using the metric system. Okay. Well, you know what? That, that it's that's a thing. It can happen. Um, so we're going into the colder months. So a lot of you that are new to the car took delivery in the summertime. You're going into the colder months. Three things are going to happen to your car. Now we're going into th- into the months into the colder months. First, you're not going to get regen first thing in the morning. Your battery's cold. Okay. Second thing, you. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to get TPMS warnings. Your tire pressure is cold. Uh, you know it, it, it compresses, and your your pressures in the tires are going to are going to go down. So that's the second thing. Third one, you're going to lose range. It happens. It's in the winter months. The great thing is that when the spring comes back, uh, everything comes back automatically. So, um, and I'm I'm sure that a lot of new users are, are going to be flooding social media and stuff. What happened? Well, that's what's going to happen to your car. So enjoy the car while you have it now. In the winter months, you're going to lose some of that. But the nice thing is it all, is come, all comes back in the spring. The other thing so. I was going to add here, uh, Trevor, uh, is Daniel. I hope you're listening. It's, it's just us. No one else is really listening right now. <laughs> um, understand something, and Trevor's right. The numbers are just that. They're numbers. Uh, if you're able to charge the car every day, you say you don't try to go below 20%. So I'm assuming you have either office charging, uh, you use destination charging, you're charging at home. Um, as long as you're able to get it, a place to charge your car and charge it where you need to for your daily commute for weekend trips for whatever it is you're fine it's okay i've seen fluctuations in my own vehicle where um there was a software update some months ago one of the major updates that came out um where we were first introduced to some new games in the arcade and there was a new ui and a whole bunch of other updates and my vehicle was charging up to at 90 percent was essentially like mid 280s like 285, 286, around there. And then within a matter of a month, I could barely crack 275, 276. Um, So the numbers, the numbers can certainly change over time with software updates, with uh, usage, other stuff. Um, There are environmental factors, as Trevor outlined, that can also make a difference. Um, Ever since I changed my my display from mileage to, or distance, I should say, to um, percentage, I don't even think about it. Like I know if I lose 1%, it's a little over three miles that I've driven. Um, but as long as I can see 90%, 75%, so forth, then I'm like, okay, I got, I got 20% left. I'm, I can, I need to charge the car. Like it's, it's a lot, it's a little, a little bit easier. We talked on the show recently, um, with some, uh, with Raphael and others about mileage versus percentages and how that impacts it. Because if you're trying to track how your driving performance is and how, you know, how it's affecting your range overall, but um, also try considering if you do this intro mode thing, do that test too. But also try just going to percentage mode and see if percentage, if you do like, okay, well, the car is charging to 90%. And then just see where it goes from there. And then if, if you're getting more or less, you know, the, your percentage loss is, is comparable, then, then you're fine. Uh, I always try to tell people, anybody who's new, anybody I encounter and stuff, if I see them operating in miles or kilometers, I always encourage them, switch it to percentage. And... Um, You'll find that your range anxiety, if you have any, just kind of disappears. You don't even think about it anymore. Just car gets to 20%, start thinking about charging. Otherwise, don't worry about it. Yeah. That's just me. I mean, people don't panic because, like, all of a sudden they can't fill their gas tank the same way. Yeah. You know what I mean, it's like, oh my God, I got 8.6 gallons. It, you're fine. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Find a gas yeah. station. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. Last question of the evening comes from Roger. He says, when on autopilot or speed control mode and the car slows or stops, does it use the wheel brakes? Oh, you've uh, asked. Why? We've, this is we've talked. Yeah, we've talked about this. This is a question that comes up once in a while. It's a blend. It's a blend. More, more often than not, it's circ- I think it's circumstantial. Um, so I'll quickly tell Roger. Um, I use autopilot on my twenty some odd mile commute to and from work every day. Um, most of the time, the car is decelerating with just uh Regen. without using the actual physical brakes. It's not using the ABS brakes. Um, and uh, but if there is an emergency situation or if a car cuts me off or you know something is more urgent then it can have a hybrid where it starts the motors through the computer and then the the actual physical brakes can take over um but usually if you're driving at fairly reasonable speeds and traffic is normal 
um, you're really not using the, the actual brakes uh, that much. Yeah. In, in, in stop and go traffic, it does use the brakes. Yeah. Right? In traffic, you know, if you're on the highway and, you know, and, and it starts decelerating, no, that, that's regen. If it brakes mm-hmm. hard, you can feel the brakes and stuff. But in stop and go traffic, it's a blend of both. It's a blend of regen but and braking. So, um, but anyways, the nice thing about the Model 3, um, and there are other EVs on the market that do this, but when the brakes are not being used, the, the pistons actually retract and they pull the brake pads off the rotor so it really reduces your fit uh, increases your efficiency by reducing friction so there's right. a lot of stuff that tesla's done to mitigate a lot of that stuff that ends that's the end that's the end of the questions i want to say thank you for everybody who wrote in um yeah. we love the questions uh, some of them were a little repetitious sometimes but that's okay we can't expect everybody who's yeah, it's been following us from the beginning the show it's all it is <laughs> they're not hitting, uh, the ar- hitting the archives yeah um, before I, uh, before we both sign off, I just want to say um, thank you as always to Ian, even though he can't show up tonight. Um, I will say if you want to follow him, his Twitter handle is Mad Hungarian. Just look it up and uh, check out his uh, fantastic line of T-shirts. You can find those on Teespring, T-E-E Spring.com. Just look up Mad Hungarian. You'll see he was, uh, his Evolve Wear uh, T-shirts. Put a, put a little plug in there for him. Of course, it'll be in the video in the podcast. What What's that? He calls himself Matt, but his, his Twitter handle is at Ian Pavelko. Th- that's true, but you can just search for Matt Hunger and you'll find him on there. He's our resident. He's our resident uh, tire and wheel expert. He's on the forum as well. Check him out if you got any questions about wheels and tires. He's the man to uh, to talk to. So, anyways, he's having a little staycation and uh, not going too far, but we talk to him on a daily basis. So, hey Ian, if you're listening in the car, buddy, we miss you. But we'll see you next time. Um, Eric, what do you want to plug? How can people find you if they want to have a chat with you? So sure, uh, you guys can find me on Twitter. The handle is EC Fix. It is E C F I X. Uh, quick shout out to our friend Michael Bodner uh, at Tesla Tunity. Uh, our condolences and thoughts are with you and the family. Uh, so uh, hopefully things are looking on the bright side. And um, again, if you if you're looking for some really awesome stuff, uh, we have some great sponsors of the show. Uh, Dualaban Insurance. That's up in our friends in Canada. Uh, we have uh, Evanex, uh, which does aftermarket stuff for Tesla. You can look, like, and pretty soon, once the Model Y comes out, they'll have some Model Y stuff for sure. you. And uh, also, um, I'm blanking on the the Fine for, Lab. Fine Lab, that's it for your premium protection for your beautiful, vehicle. awesome ceramic coatings, man. Nothing mm-hmm. sticks to that stuff. It's like Teflon for your clear coat. It's awesome. Love it. <laughs> So, yeah. All right. Well, thanks for that. And of course, if you want to follow me, you can check it out. Uh, my handle's Matt. Uh, Matt Hungarian. <laughs> Model Three owners on uh, on Twitter. I'm on the forum, of course. TeslaOwnersOnline.com. All my handles on there's Trev P. And uh, yeah, check out our sponsors. I want to say thank you to those three guys. And we will see you next time. Thanks for listening and watching. No matter happened to be, we'll see you next time. See you guys. Take care.